Uh, Well, welcome this morning. Before I get started with the message part of today, I want to introduce you to five of my friends. Uh, We got back from winter camp last Sunday. There were 45 in all who were there. Uh, And we wanted to tell you thank you for your generosity in helping kids get to camp. We told every one of our junior high school students, you want to go to camp, we'll get you there. No questions. Uh, And many, many, many of them did. And we spent an hour on Monday with the junior highers and an hour on Wednesday with the high schoolers hearing them talk about what God told them and commitments that they had made. Uh, and it was, it was I, I, Jeff and I were talking like, we need to, you need to hear this. Um, so one, thank you for your generosity. But secondly, I want you to hear from them uh, what God did in their lives and their response to that. So Zoe, tell us your name and your story. My name is Zoe. Thank you. And I'm in seventh grade and go to Rancho's Middle School. And one thing that really led me closer to God in camp um, I feel like the preacher there was saying, like, he really led me closer and gave me a new perspective on God. So what I imagined it to be like, you're only at church, only we just sang with God, we praised him and all, and then we pray at home and everything. But then that's all I thought, just church, home, church, home, only God there. But then... um, he really told me to fear God more than the world. So I've decided to give my life, well, praise God everywhere, not just church and home. And (laughs) he led, he led me through everything and is giving me just a new, like I said, new perspective on how God should be everywhere with you and not just church and home. And one thing I committed to was preaching God, like I said, everywhere, not just church and home. And it's really healed my heart and given me, like, just better stuff. (laughs) Thank you. That's awesome. Good job, I'm proud of you. Good job. Um, Before I start, it's my mom's birthday. She's in the corner. (laughs) Happy birthday, Mom. (laughs) Hello, everybody. My name is Gage. I'm 14. I go to Rancho's Middle School. Um, The experience at camp was great. I can't wait to go back next year. The way God spoke to me was that anything I do without him is meaningless. Um, After leaving camp, I made a decision to bring God more into the things that I do. (sighs) I'm going to be honest. I get stage fright. This is... I I can't do this, but... (laughs) Um, but another thing I remembered that camp teached me was that not to be afraid of like this stuff, but to be more afraid of God. And I want to fear God than this. Um, and that gave me a new point, viewpoint. That was my two days well spent at camp. Thank you for listening. Good job, dude. Good job, man. Good job, man. Hi, my name is Kendall. I'm in seventh grade at Rancho's Middle School. And the way that God spoke to me was through the worship. It was so amazing to be able to worship with my friends and the people that I didn't know. If I'm being honest, I was losing faith in a lot of things that I would be doing in like my daily life. And I was trying to remind myself that everything happens for a reason, but what was the reason? Hmm. And when I went to camp, my life changed. My Mm -hmm. whole perspective on life and my whole perspective on God changed. I finally realized that I am made for a reason, Mm -hmm. I'm here for a reason, and I was at camp for a reason. Mm -hmm. The thing that I committed to at camp was to be a light to everybody and anybody that I come across. Mm -hmm. I never want to make anybody feel unloved or unwanted or alone, how I feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I need to remind myself and others that I'm never alone when I have God that he loves me, hmm. and that he will always want me. Yeah. That is what I learned from camp. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. Hi, my name is Trenton. Um, I'm 16. I go to Liberty High School. Um, and the way that God spoke to me at winter camp was through the worship. 
Um, it was very powerful. Um, the worship here is is great. Don't get me wrong, but the worship <laughs> there it was it was it was different. It was way way more powerful. I felt way way more comfortable there than I did here. I felt like nobody nobody was watching me and what I was doing. Um, and the speaker, he he did a great job. Um, I felt like I didn't do what God was calling us to do. I felt that I was lacking in, in my faith. And so now I, I came home and now I'm uh, helping serving at the junior high school youth groups. Right on. Right on. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun to be there and watch the, watch the kids grow clo closer to God. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> 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 right then. Camp, camp really changed me. What commitment you make, Trenton? I, I recommitted my life to Jesus. That's cool. <laughs> Love you. My name is Macy Cox. I'm a sophomore at Liberty High School. And I got the pleasure of spending two days in the presence of Jesus Christ at Hume Lake. The way God spoke to me at Warner Camp was through worship. Getting to hear God's word through music surrounded with my best friends is really special. I felt God everywhere I looked this weekend. The decision I made was to lead more people to Christ. And that's my commitment because Heather and Trish asked me this summer to serve in children's ministry. And, you know, I thought, yeah, I'll do it for fun. Like, it's just fun. And then right before I left for Hume, three of the little girls I served with on Sunday came up to me, and they just told me how special I was and how much they would miss me. Mm. So when I came back, I just decided that I really am making an impact on people, and that's what I want to keep doing. So thank you guys for helping us be able to go to Hume. Um, I know all of us, everybody who isn't here, it was really special. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, stay here, stay here for just a minute. Um, we spent an hour on Monday and an hour on Wednesday hearing stories just like that from all the kids that went and the counselors, the adults. Um, and I just wanted to tell you as a church, thank you. Some of you have been extraordinarily generous in making sure that any kid who wanted to go to that human camp got to do that. And so thank you. Thank you for understanding the priority and the importance of ministry to children and youth. Many churches don't. Thank you for not just understanding it, but supporting it and perpetuating it. Uh, we have a big presence and role in this community with our students. Um, and we are all very grateful uh, to you for being a church that makes that happen. Um, I love you guys. I'm very proud of you. Uh, and when Jeff and I started leading the junior high and the high school group on Monday and Wednesdays, um, it's been fantastic. The students that we get to interact with as they go through life and grow up, and as they learn faith and obedience and submission, is so, so profound. We've got a great group of young people in this church. And God is doing incredible things in them and you. Um, and I'm telling you, man, if you are not 
in the regular business of serving God through serving his people, you're missing out on so much. And I invite you into that. But for now, I want you to join me in prayer. Not just for these five, but for these students who are both a part of our ministry and who are not yet a part of God's kingdom. That's why we're here. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your unending love. Thank you that these five here and all these kids in our ministry, thank you that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you knit them together in their mother's womb. Thank you that that's true for all of us. And Father, I thank you for the parents that you've chosen for these students, that they are specifically chosen or, and ordained by you for that holy and sacred task of raising them. I thank you for entrusting them to us. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in their lives and what you did in them, through them, and with them. And I thank you even more for what's coming. I pray protection over all these, these five here and all these who are making commitments to you. I pray your protection over them, your guidance of them, that they would be submissive and pliable to your spirit, that you'd protect them, that they would grow in purity and in steadfastness of faith. And I pray that we would do a good job of mentoring and discipling them and that they would change the world. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. In your name I pray, amen. Will you give them a hand? Great job. Great job. As the leaders and we're going through that on Monday and Wednesday, and Jeff and I were talking throughout the week, we just thought, we, you need to hear these stories. Um, instead of inviting all of you to Wednesday and Monday night because you won't show up, we thought we would bring some of them here. I told them the Friday they left, that was the 41-year anniversary of my camp experience. Um, when God got a hold of me and the speaker talked about Excel still more and how I was sitting with my freshman football coach who was my counselor, uh, and talking about how I had to get serious with my faith. Um, and I knew that was coming for him, and I'm so thankful for you as a church for making sure that that could happen. So thank you. In this series, Unstoppable, we're going through the book of Acts. We looked at Acts 17 last week, and this week we're going to go into Acts 18 but, but I, there's something that happened at the end of Acts 17 and, and in Acts 18 that, that radically, I think, changed and if not changed, at least formatted the rest of Paul's life and his work. And it centers around the message that he preached to the people in Athens on a place called Mars Hill. Acts 17 verses. 16 through 31, Paul gives this impassioned, brilliant, crafted message to the religious people and the philosophers, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. He crafts this beautiful, and if you go to seminary and Bible college this and take a preaching class, this message in Acts on Mars Hill is trumpeted as, a, as the masterpiece of messages. And it really is quite something. And then right after Acts 17, he goes to Corinth. And there's a difference between what happens in Athens and what happens in Corinth. In Athens, in this brilliant message that Paul preaches, he never mentions Jesus or the cross. And I believe this is the only place where Paul spent much time and preached where a church was not started after this brilliant message. It was filled with great reasoning. It was filled with great philosophy. But little was the result. 
Matter of fact, he says, and I'll just read part of it. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And on down later, this God, he has determined the time set for people and the exact places where they should live. Verse 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. When they had heard him talk about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered and others said, yeah, why don't you come back and tell us more? No mention of Jesus, no mention of the cross, no church started. A few happened to believe, but there was no real great work done. And in Corinth, his tactics change. He has one message in Corinth, Christ and him crucified. And as a result of that, a huge church is birthed that's really messy and really full of grace. But look at what Paul says when he moves from Athens and this message on Mars Hill to Corinth. Look at what he says. Look at, his, look at his strategy now. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but, it, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where is the wise person? Where's the teacher of the law? Where's the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. The thing that happened between 17 and 18 is Paul did work all his might to provide this persuasive, brilliant message about God and never got to Jesus. He leaves there, goes to Corinth, and he says, okay, let me reboot this. Christ and him crucified. That's the only thing I'm ever going to talk about again. Here's the key. All the transformation that is needed in your life, in my life, centers on Jesus and the cross. Jesus and the cross is God's message to us of his love. Jesus and the cross is God's message to us of his forgiveness. Jesus and the cross is God's message to us of his love and forgiveness, and then thereby our message to others of his love and forgiveness. Jesus and the cross. Paul mentions in Acts 17, 31, in that brilliant message, talking about God and the man he has appointed, meaning Jesus, but never talks, never says the name. It's easy to believe in God without acknowledging Jesus. Don't tell me that you believe in God. The issue is your relationship with Jesus. Only Jesus and the cross changes anything. Everything else is man-made wisdom. Everything else is self-development. Everything else is self-actualization. Everything else is self-help. Everything else is my might and my ability to change my life and be the master of my own ship. It's only Jesus and the cross. Everything else will fall short. Here's what I know. Here's what we know. Our change and transformation comes only by Jesus because of the cross. It's the power of salvation, and it's the key to life. And this was the change that happened in Paul. No more persuasive words. No more fine-sounding arguments. You want to talk? Let's talk. It's Jesus 
and the cross. And so we get to Acts 18.1. And in Acts 18.1, after this, after what, after Athens, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So at this point in Acts 18, Paul is in Corinth. And Corinth is a nasty place. It is a horrific place. It's full of debauchery and sexuality and lawlessness. Think about it as San Francisco and Las Vegas and New York all crammed together. And not the good parts like the Golden Gate Bridge and the Raiders and like (laughs) nothing of New York, but like just all the nasties of it all, all crammed together. That was Corinth. Matter of fact, there was a derogatory saying of the worst of the worst of humanity. They would call them a nickname, and their nickname was Corinthian. It was horrible. And Paul would have never seen himself in that place when he was his religious self. He would have never been there. But here's what Paul did. He said yes to God on the front end. And then he let God lead him wherever God wanted him. And it led him to a place Paul never thought he would be. Here's what I want us to understand. That God can put you where God wants you if you've said yes to God on the front end. Once you say yes to God on the front end and given him complete authority to do and with you and move you whatever he wants, he'll get you exactly where he wants you. And so the lesson is this. If you have a submissive and pliable spirit. God has you where he wants you right now. Now understand what this means. If I have been living with God with a submissive and pliable spirit, he has me where he wants me. Even if I didn't plan on being here, even if this is nastier than I thought it would be, even if it's more difficult, even if I could have picked this out of anywhere... If you're living with the pliable and submissive spirit, you are exactly where God wants you to be. Whether with a job or jobless, you're exactly where God wants you to be. Trust him. Whether it's in health or a hospital bed, for some reason, you're exactly where God wants you to be. Trust him. Whether you're in a relationship or a single, guess what? You're exactly where God wants you to be. Stay submissive and pliable. You can be at peace. But see, here's the opposite of this. See, if you have a submissive and pliable spirit, God has you exactly where he wants you, so you can be at peace where you are. But if you have a stubborn spirit, you may not be where God wants you right now. The more we kick against and push against and reject what God wants to do, the less likely we are where God wants us to be. Now, God can still get you where he wants you. See the book of Jonah. But none of us want to get to where God wants us in the belly of a fish, yeah? It's nasty. It's stinky. God is not above using nasty and stinky. But that's not what he wants for us. He wants us to be submissive and pliable. If we push against that, it's it's going to get rough. And so the first lesson, get and keep a submissive, pliable spirit and trust that where God has you is where he wants you. Paul did. And I love what Paul did when he got to Corinth. If you look in your Bibles, and I'll just read it from mine, There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. so, so, So Paul gets to Corinth, and the first people he finds are disciples like him. There were a lot of people in Corinth that were not disciples. Matter of fact, most of them weren't. And he made sure that he found two of God's people who were disciples just like him. 
One of the thing that thing that teaches me is that God has people everywhere. God is never without his people. He's got his people everywhere. And Paul chose those who were closest to him to be people who were walking with Jesus like he was. Those closest to Paul were not those walking away from Jesus, but were those who were walking with Jesus. It's a really important lesson for us to glean from Paul. To make certain that those closest to you in your huddle are those who are disciples of Jesus. I'm not saying don't have other people in your huddle who don't know him. You absolutely must because God put you in their life to introduce the two, them and God. But those closest to you must be, if you are a disciple of Jesus, those closest to your huddle must also be disciples of Jesus. Because we will become like those we are most closely associated with. And this is as true with faith as it is any other thing. We become like those we are most closely associated with. And so Paul knew, I'm in a spot that is difficult. I don't know if I'm here because God put me here. I need people in my world closest to me who are also following Jesus intimately also. Not walking away from him, not neglect, but actually living passionately for him. This is, this is like this in every area of life. It's certainly like this in our faith. Have you ever noticed that super generous people have close friends who are super generous people? It's no coincidence. Stingy people don't hang out with generous people. And generous people cannot hang out with stingy people. Ever notice that those who are serving hang out with those who are serving? Those people who have a bold public witness hang out with people who have a bold public witness. It's just the way things work. We become like those we most closely associate with. And so, if you know that you're not where you want to be or need to be, as far as your faith experience and your faith life is concerned, you may need to change those who are closest to you in your huddle. If you want to be faithful in church every Sunday, guess what? You need to have people in your huddle who are faithful in church every Sunday. You want to read your Bible every day? You need to have the closest people in your huddle reading their Bible, people who read their Bible every day. And what this means is there may need to be some pairing away of those who are closest to us in our huddle. There may need to be a pursuit, a strategic pursuit of people closest in our lives, of faithful disciples who are Christ. Does that make sense? Let's just look at verses 6 and then 9 through 11. Paul goes and he's talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when the Jews opposed Paul and and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Verse 9, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. So Paul's at it again, doing what he does, and the same thing starts happening. I mean, Paul, how many times have you seen this in Paul? You look through the book of Acts. He talks about Jesus. People get upset at him. They start beating him up. He's been beaten, left for dead. He's been imprisoned. He, he just is one, one time after another, after another, after another. And here he is in, in, in Corinth doing the same thing. I'm just telling you about Jesus. And he meets all this opposition from all these hyper-religious people. And he doesn't stay around for it. 
He says, your blood be on your own heads. I'm, 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 I'm clear of my responsibility. He's faith to his call, but he doesn't stay around and invite abuse. It makes sense. And he says, from now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. In other words, he's saying, all you hyper-religious people, you're not open to hear about Jesus and the message of God's grace? Fine, I'll go to people who are willing to hear about it. It's the biblical instruction, don't throw your pearls before the swine. In other words, don't try to convince your hyper-religious people about the grace of God. Here's why. Religious people are not open to grace, they just want law. Sinners are the only ones who are open to grace. And so Paul says, I'm going to take these pearls of God and throw them before the swine. You're not going to pay attention anyway. All you want is the law. I'm going to go to people who realize that they need Jesus, who realize how beautiful God's grace is. I'm going to talk to them. And listen, this is our church. If you're hyper-religious and you want the law, you just don't fit here and you don't last. Grace is messy and grace traces religious people away. Those of us at Flipside, um, we're led by the chiefest of sinners. You understand that, right? And I have a church full of sinners. You understand that, right? And that's why we love grace. The grace of God, his favor and blessing that is unmerited and undeserved to someone like me. And so God tells him, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. Why does God tell him don't be afraid? Yeah, don't miss the simplicity of it. God tells him don't be afraid because he's getting a little afraid. I mean, think about it. Imagine what Paul's going through. Not, not this again. Frank, all I'm doing is telling you about Jesus and his love, God's love for you that was expressed through his son, the message of the Christ, mercy, and all you want to do is beat me up again? Why is this happening again? All I'm trying to do is give you the, the, the thing that you're looking for. You know you're looking for it. It's going to be, it's, and all you want to do is throw rocks at me and beat me up and cast me out and leave me for dead? Like, how long do I have to keep beating my head against this wall? Have you ever felt that way? Like how much more? I'm tired of this. I'm tired. I don't know how much more abuse I can take from you people. I'm just, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to go through it again. You know what? It's easier if you just keep my mouth shut, just back off, just don't, don't push so much. It's just, I'm just, I'm you're a fella just checking out. So Paul gets a little fearful. And honestly, it's just easier to back off. If you've ever tried to be vocal about your faith, it, at times it gets a little bit scary. If you've ever told God yes on the front end, it gets a little bit scary about what he might ask you then to do. If you've ever decided to be all in as a disciple, it gets a little fearful about the changes that you might have to make now. And I remember, I was in junior high. My brother was a sophomore in high school. And he went to camp. And he had one of those moments with Jesus at camp. And my brother was running with some guys he shouldn't be running with and doing stuff that was not at all in line uh, with God's call on his life and his faith. And my brother Eric came back and told me, I have to make some changes with my friends. And one in particular, he said, I have to tell him I can't hang out with him anymore because I'm a Christian and I'm following Jesus. And I watched my brother as a sophomore in high school. Do you know what it's like for a young man and a young woman at that young age to have the courage and the boldness to be obedient 
and disassociate from their friend group because of their faith? I was in awe of my brother. Because sometimes it's scary. Right? And so Paul was scared, and God told him two things. He said, don't be fearful. Be obedient. See, here's the truth. The antidote to fear is obedience. That's why God said, don't be afraid. Be obedient. Every time we face fear and respond in obedience, we realize a couple things. One, we realize that God's commands are actually blessings. They're for good and not for ill. And the second thing we realize is that God can, is faithful and we can trust him. And the moment we realize that God's commands, though we're fearful to obey, are good and for our good, not for ill, and that God is trustworthy and can be obeyed, it dispels fear. See, the equation looks like, this is God's equation. This is how it works. God's equation is not, don't be fearful so that you are obedient. Rather, his equation is be obedient so that you conquer fear. That's God's equation. And so many people, we get it backwards. We say, God, help me not be fearful so I can be obedient. God says, no, be obedient and you'll conquer fear. Do you understand? See, the fearlessness does not come in God making us courageous. The fearlessness comes in us choosing to be obedient in the midst of fear. And the moment that happens, I become victorious over fear that the only reason fear exists is to keep me from being obedient. And so God says, don't be afraid. Be obedient. So just think for a moment. What's the last thing God told you to do? What's that thing that you know that God said, this is my next step for you? What's the next thing that you know that is your next step of obedience? What's that thing that you know that you're called to be obedient and you don't want to? You know what God would say? Be obedient. Don't be scared of it. Be obedient. And God says, don't be fearful. Be obedient. Why does he say that? Because I am what? He says, because I'm with you. And if I'm with you, If I'm with you, who can be against you? If I'm with you, no weapon formed against you will prosper. People might come after you, but they will not destroy you because I'm with you. So be obedient. God says, not only am I with you, he says, I got guys. God says, I got guys. I got guys in this city. I'm with you. I got guys. Be obedient. Guess what? God's got guys. And and when when God tells Paul, I got guys in this city, what God is saying is this. I have people already like Aquila and Priscilla. I got people already that are following me. You might not know it yet, but the moment you become obedient and dispel fear, you'll start seeing them. I got people. But what God is also saying is this. I got people who are not my people yet, but who will be my people because you're fearless and you keep talking about me. I got guys. Because that's what happens when God's unstoppable church is full of God's unstoppable disciples. And so let me just wrap up with this. We become unstoppable when We say yes to God on the front end. God, I'm going to give you a yes. Whatever that means. 
Help me understand where it is you're taking me, but I'm just going to give you a yes. We become unstoppable when we move, when we, 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 we keep a submissive and pliable spirit. We say, God, you're the potter, I'm the clay. Whatever it is you want to make me, make me. We become unstoppable when we beat fear with obedience. God, I know this is what you've asked of me. I don't want to, but I'm going to. God, I'm a little bit fearful what this might mean, but I'm going to. We become unstoppable when we keep talking about Jesus and the cross. Like I said last week, that our, our, our world's going to get stupid real soon with these election stuff. And all it's going to be is a distraction. Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. And so the question that I have for me and for us is which of those four is your commitment today? If you're a disciple of Jesus, there's got to be one of them. Someone in the first service said, all four. I'm like, don't be an overachiever. Let's just pick one. Like, Just pick one. One's enough for now. There's two camps in this room right now. One camp is people who are just investigating this, just asking, asking questions, seeking out God, what's it mean? But I'm glad you're here. This is a good, safe place for you to be and ask questions and just kind of pursue and investigate. I invite you to stay and keep investigating. My prayer is that you'll understand the mercy and grace of God and his loving kindness will woo you to him. And you'll see a bunch of sinners who are learned to follow God and receive his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness because of his love. And you'll be won over. But if that's you, I would invite, I would encourage you that today's your day for that. Just choose him. But the other camp in this place are people who have already chosen God. but who need God to encourage them before they say yes to him and who haven't got, given God a blank check. Others in this place are those who, 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 who call themselves Christians but surely don't have a submissive or pliable spirit. That kick against God, kick against what he's doing, kick against him and you're miserable and you're tired and you're angry and it's not fun to be around. There's others here who have said yes to Jesus, but you live in more fear than obedience. And you know exactly what God has asked of you. But you've yet chosen to be obedient. And there's some of you here who know the beautiful expression of God's love through Jesus on the cross, but boy, you sure got a closed mouth about it. And so, in following Scripture and the example God gave us in Paul, it's time for God's church to make commitments that will shape us and our families and our futures. And so I invite you to do that now. Would you pray with me? Those of you who haven't yet accepted Jesus as your Savior or who have, but you've all you've been doing is walking the other direction from him. Perhaps this is your day. I know it is. In the quietness of this moment between you and a God who loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you. Would you take this opportunity? Don't let it pass you by. Would you just tell him, God, forgive me of my arrogance and my ego that would think I could do this life without you. I'm sorry. I, I guess I was just ignorant. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I just confessed my sin. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I accept, Jesus, what you did on the cross so I could be right with the Father. God, I'm yours. You are mine. You've chosen me, and so I choose you. I'm coming back. I want to 
thrive intimate relationship with you. So I accept you as my leader and my Lord right now. If that's been your prayer, man, welcome home. Welcome to the family. Eternity is going to be awesome. And your life just got better. But if you are having a relationship with Jesus, I'd encourage you, one of these others, maybe you just need to say, God, I'm giving you a yes on the front end. I say yes to everything. So whatever you don't want me to do, whatever you don't want me to go, tell me no. But I'm saying yes to everything. And I'm choosing a submissive and pliable spirit. Submitting to you. Submitting to what's asked of me. Put me where you want me. You have my okay. Maybe you are the one who needs to say, God, I'm going to choose to be obedient. And I am scared to death. And it's going to mean some changes. And I don't want the changes that it's going to mean. But I know that it's the right thing. And so today I choose obedience. Help me fear you more than I fear the change. Help me fear you more than I fear others. I choose obedience. And I trust you. Maybe this is you. Maybe you need to say, God, loosen my lips. Help me realize it's not about me being eloquent or persuasive. Just give me a simple faith that wants to talk about you and the cross, Jesus. Father, I thank you that nothing we do could separate us or mute or disqualify us from your love. I thank you that there's no commitment we can make that would make you love us more. It's amazing to me. And I pray that we understand how profound your mercy and your grace are, that those would draw us into a deep and abiding discipleship. Father, help us love you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. Your word says that your eyes range to and fro about the earth to see those whose hearts are fully yours, that you might strongly support them. Father, you got people here whose hearts are turning to you, whose hearts are becoming fully yours, whose hearts are fully yours. See us here in this place. See us here. See us. You are Elroy, the God who sees. See us that you might strongly support us as our hearts turn to you. May your kingdom come. May your will be done in our world as it is in heaven. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you for this time we can be together. In your name I pray, amen. Listen, I love you. And I love going through the Bible with you. It is so good. Next week we're going to get through the more of this portion of Acts and Acts 19. It gets crazy with Paul. Crazy. And I'm so thankful that it's there for us. Read ahead, get ready. You understand? I got one more thing for you. Okay? Go Baltimore and go Detroit. Let's see. (laughs) 